Welcome to this online webinar. My name is Dr. Caroline Gibbs and I'm a clinical psychologist for the Richmond Wellbeing Service. The webinar today is going to be looking at children's return to school after lockdown and we're going to have a particular focus on emotionally related school avoidance. So it's a bit more of a focused look at children who are struggling particularly with the return to school after lockdown. And obviously we know that many children felt daunted at the prospect of going back to school, but that some children are finding it that little bit harder than others. So the areas that we're going to cover today are common worries that children might be experiencing when returning to school. We'll have a, a, a quick look at what anxiety is, how it influences our body, our thoughts and our behaviour. And then we're going to kind of focus a bit more into the emotionally related school avoidance. So what this is, the avoidance cycle and how to reverse it. And we're going to present our plan of action, which is a six part model. OK, so let's just start by having a quick look at the common worries that children have reported ahead of or during their return to school after this most recent lockdown. So we know that some children are particularly concerned about catching the coronavirus. So what if they touch someone or bump into something? What if they will forget the new rules or they get told off because they've done something wrong? We also know that children are worried about catching up with schoolwork and the fact that they've missed quite a lot of time. Or perhaps they're worried about friendship issues. And equally, some children have been really worried about missing life at home. So missing mum, dad or other people at home that they've been sort of accustomed to spending a lot more time with. And many of these worries are really understandable in the current context. You know, it's really natural that some children are going to be feeling apprehensive or kind of struggling a bit more with that return to school. And we know there's not sort of necessarily a one universal worry for children and families. You might find that your child has a range of worries that cut across different topics, such as the ones we've just talked through, or they might be much more focused on one particular area. And we also know that some children for example, those with special educational needs or perhaps neurodevelopmental conditions or those who have a history of being a bit more anxious, what they will have found the transition that little bit more difficult perhaps to navigate. OK, and this is a bit of a reminder, but I think important for us to cover. So we know that children won't necessarily tell us outright if they're feeling worried or what it is that they're worried about. So as adults, it's really important that we're aware of some of the key things to watch out for as possible signals and signs that children are feeling worried or anxious. And what we know is that anxiety tends to present itself in three kind of key ways. So we're going to run through these in a bit more detail over the coming slides. But to summarise, we know that there's very likely to be a change in bodily sensations. We tend to refer to this as the fight, flight, freeze response. And we're going to show a short video on this shortly. We also know that children's thinking might be impacted. And actually, this is the same with adults. So when we feel anxious about something, we tend to overestimate the chances of danger ahead and we also underestimate our ability to cope and manage. And finally, what we also see is that change in behaviour. So often we'll try to adapt our behaviour in an attempt to manage the anxiety. So the kind of common things that we might see are trying to avoid a worrying situation. We also see lots of reassurance seeking and we also see changes in behaviour. So perhaps becoming more emotionally expressive, perhaps some tantrums, perhaps children becoming very upset or even angry. And a very common sort of thing that we see in children, particularly younger children, but children of all ages, is that they complain of feeling unwell. So they might talk about having a tummy ache or a headache. And obviously with this heightened sensitivity to COVID at the moment, it's understandable that parents might be concerned if a child says that they're feeling unwell. But it's also just important to hold in mind that these can also be symptoms of anxiety. OK, so we're going to start by looking at the bodily sensation. So that fight, flight, freeze response that happens in our body when we start to feel anxious. And some of the ideas in this video might not be new to you at all, but it's just helpful to have a reminder. And also to remember that these physiological responses that are described are just as applicable to us as adults as they are to children. Humans, like all species, have self-protective mechanisms to help us survive. Our fight, flight or freeze survival response, the FFF for short, is designed to mobilize our brain and body to fight an enemy, run from an avalanche or freeze to hide from a predator. 
Our brain sometimes misinterprets safe situations as dangerous and can set off false alarms. When the amygdala, our brain's watchdog, senses and barks danger, our body enters survival mode quicker than our rational mind can react, leaving it trying to figure out why we feel in mortal danger. When the FFF alarm is sounded, we start to breathe more quickly and shallow, causing hyperventilation, and our heart starts beating very fast. These changes can cause strong chest pain, which many people interpret as symptoms of a heart attack, when in fact it's just a result of the FFF activation, which can be relieved through breathing exercises. As a way of getting you ready for action, blood is diverted towards the major muscle groups. Blood flows away from our digestive system, causing the bladder to relax and we might feel the need to pee. The mouth goes dry, nausea can occur and we get the butterflies feeling in our stomach. Blood also rushes from extremities, leaving us with cold hands but often sweaty palms as the action-ready body starts sweating to avoid overheating. Legs and hands can start trembling and feel weak while tension starts building in big muscles like the thighs, neck and shoulders. In our head, FFF alarms cause our brain to focus on negative memories, probably so it can scan them to avoid danger and negative outcomes. We get tunnel vision as our pupils dilate to increase our focus and long vision, but as a result, we lose our peripheral vision. FFF activation also reduces our ability to recognize differences in facial expressions. Too much oxygen and too little CO2 can result in dizziness or lightheadedness, which many people interpret as signs that they might faint. But because fainting is caused by a drastic drop in blood pressure, and because the FFF increases both our heart rate and blood pressure, it's nearly impossible to faint when this happens. Over time, depression, anxiety, and high levels of stress all harm the brain's ability to slow or cancel false FFF activations, causing them to happen more often. Knowing the symptoms of false activations makes it easier to recognize and reduce their effects. At Tanky Boxing, you can learn both bottom-up and top-down techniques to reduce false FFF activation and bring your body back to balance. Human. Okay, so hopefully that was a helpful reminder about what's going on in our bodies when we start to feel worried or anxious about something. And another characteristic that we see is anxious thinking. So as I said before, this is where we tend to overestimate the likelihood that something bad will happen and we underestimate how well, will we, how well we will cope if it does happen. So here we have some examples of what children might be thinking about coming back to school, but it's important to state here that not all children will find it easy to recognise or verbalise their anxious thoughts. So here's some examples. The teacher will become cross with me, if I bump into someone or someone bumps me, I might get coronavirus and I'll never catch up on the work. And the underestimation of their ability to cope, I won't be able to manage, I won't be able to talk to anyone and I can't do it. So that sort of sense of hopelessness and lacking in confidence in their abilities. And you might have asked your child lots of time what it is, what are you worried about, what's going on for you? And they might have struggled to articulate it. But when children can articulate their anxious thoughts, it can feel really difficult as a parent or carer to hear your child say things like that. And so we're going to come on to thinking about how you can respond when they do make statements such as these. And then finally, the third characteristic is our anxious behaviour. So while some children might be quite good at disguising or at least not verbalising their anxious thoughts or perhaps referring to bodily sensations, you are quite likely to notice a change in their behaviour. So you might notice them becoming a bit more withdrawn or clingy. You might find that they start asking more questions about what will happen in some attempt to seek reassurance. So really watching out for those what if statements, what if this happens, what if that happens. And as I said before, we, we often see maybe behaviour deteriorating. So children might shout more or sort of behave in a way that seems out of character if they feel overloaded with anxiety. And small things that they would normally be able to manage might make them snap. 
And these thoughts and feelings can be really overwhelming. And often children don't have the language to describe what's happening. And that's where we might be more likely to see, you know, emotional outbursts or, or even tantrums. So as we've said, avoidance or attempts to avoid, it really is a common strategy and one that we as adults also tend to resort to when we feel nervous about something. And this is because it's just so effective in the short term. It really helps to get rid of those feelings nice and quickly. And it's also quite easy for parents to become frustrated with poor behaviour and to feel kind of tempted to get cross with your child. So what we're going to be encouraging you to do whilst recognising it's not always easy, but is really to try to look past the behaviour and really focusing in on that emotion that your child might be feeling underneath. So we'll think a bit more about that. OK, so today, as I said, we're focusing a bit more specifically on what we would call emotionally related school avoidance or ERSA. And we use this term because it reflects the fact that a child's psychological an emotional experience is playing a significant role in their wanting to avoid school. So we know that this is affecting a number of pupils following their return to school, particularly after this most recent lockdown. And it can be characterised by internalised problems. So you might find children complain that they're feeling ill without any obvious cause. Or we might see the externalised problems that we've talked about. So the avoidance or the oppositional behaviour. And you might find that these signs only occur during the weekdays or perhaps earlier on in the week, particularly those Monday mornings, and that your child seems absolutely fine the rest of the time, particularly over the weekend. And as we've said, some children might be more likely to present with these sort of signs and symptoms. So particularly those with underlying neurodevelopmental conditions, those with special educational needs, but also those with a history of anxiety, or perhaps those who might have experienced difficulties within the school environment. So if there have been historic friendship issues or issues around bullying. OK, so this slide really is to demonstrate that cycle of avoidance a bit more clearly. So here we can see your child starts to feel anxious about returning to school. Perhaps they have fears about COVID or their schoolwork or friendships and their body enters into that fight, flight, freeze mode. And we see the physical symptoms intensify. So what happens then is they're, they're, they become preoccupied with the worries and the sensations. Their focus really kind of narrows down and it becomes very difficult for them to think clearly or access any sort of bit of their rational brain or, or problem solving brain. So to try to kind of quickly rid themselves of these unpleasant sensations and the upsetting thoughts, they try to avoid what they perceive to be the cause. So in this case, avoiding school by whatever means that they can to experience that short term relief. But what we see then in the long term is that your child tends to experience an increase in the physical symptoms of anxiety as time goes on, because that threat becomes much more real and more established as each day passes. And alongside that, their confidence and their ability to cope becomes diminished. And so avoidance starts to feel like their only option. And what you might see is if your child is someone who can get into school or is kind of sporadically getting into school, you might find that they rely on what we call safety behaviours. So whilst they're getting into school, they might leave lessons or leave the rooms if they start to feel overwhelmed. So you're still seeing that avoidance, but within the school environment itself. And this graph here just demonstrates what we would see over time. So that first blue arrow, your child's expected to go off to school, sparking anxiety that we see. They then try to avoid the situation. The anxiety comes down temporarily until the next day they're expected to go to school again. But this time what you can see is that anxiety actually increases over time as their belief sort of in being able to cope diminishes and that threat perception increases. And up and down this graph goes, but each time with their anxiety kind of rising as time goes on. So we really want to kind of try and break this cycle if we can. So how do we do that? Well, a few things need to happen. We need to support your child to very gradually expose themselves to the feared situation, so going to school, but in very small manageable steps. And in our service, we call this our step-by-step -step plan. But in order for them to agree to do this, we need to ensure that everybody is on the same page. So the child and their support network really share that same plan and a shared language when talking about the anxiety. And we'll come on to this in a moment. 
We also need to ensure that your child has the ability to regulate their anxiety enough to be able to face their fears. So skilling them up with some relaxation strategies to ensure that the physical sensations don't become so overwhelming that they're not able to engage in that kind of facing of their fears. And what we see is that as they gradually start to expose themselves to the fear, the threat of that feared situation reduces and their sense of being able to cope increases. So throughout this process, what we're going to be doing is inviting the child to reflect on any experiences of actually being in the feared situation, really praising any efforts that they're making and encouraging them to reevaluate their ability to manage and cope as they're, as they're progressing through this. And so here we see a very different graph and this is what we're kind of aiming to see. So yes, initially your child's anxiety will increase as they enter that feared situation because ultimately we are asking them to do something that is very daunting. So you will see that anxiety will kind of go quite high um, and they're likely to continue to have that urge to avoid. But if they are on board with the step by step plan, if they feel strongly supported by those around them, and they're able to remain in that feared situation, what you can see here is that the anxiety comes down on its own in its own time. And as you can see here, with each repeated exposure to the feared situation, the sort of level of anxiety becomes less and less over time. And the, the sort of time that the anxiety takes to dissipate speeds up. So the fear reduces faster and quicker with repeated exposures. And it might be that we're sort of making this sound quite easy, but setting up the plan needs quite careful thought and planning. And there are a few key things that we really need to put into place to bring your child on board with this plan that really will feel quite difficult for them at the beginning. So that's what we're going to come on to looking at next. So here is our plan of action. We've got six key points and all of which are, are very important. So we've got being mindful of your own emotions as a parent or carer. We've also got the importance of creating a shared language with your child and the network around them. We want to make a really kind of clear point about empathising and validating your child. There's also the support team that we want to think about. Who can we recruit to help manage and support your child through this difficult task? And then thinking about the emotion regulation skills, so really skilling them up and equipping them to feel like they've got the, the skills to manage those uncomfortable sensations in their body. And then devising the step by step plan and eventually giving it a go. And whilst they're listed in this order, actually most of these steps are going to be used and important throughout the whole process. So we're going to talk through each of them in a bit more detail now. OK, so the first one being mindful of and attending to your own emotions as a parent or caregiver. So we know that school avoidance or outright refusal to attend school can be really, really hard on parents and carers. You might find yourself becoming very, very anxious, you know, worrying about your child's future, find it hard to imagine them being able to return to school again. You might find yourself becoming frustrated or angry with your child. And parents will often talk about feeling guilty, you know, that they're somehow responsible for what's happening. So first of all, it's really important that you kind of stop and take stock of how you're feeling and ensure that you have some support available to help you through what can be an emotional and difficult situation. And the reason we sort of make this point, you know, quite clear at the start is because if you're not able to attend to your own emotional response, it will be very difficult for you to offer your child that empathy and the validation and the support that they need to tackle this issue. So really being aware of your own thoughts. You know, are you falling into that trap of catastrophizing? Are you being pulled into this narrative of hopelessness that, you know, things aren't ever going to get better? You know, this is a really tricky situation and, and no parent or carer can manage it on their own. So it's really important for you just to take a bit of a moment to think about who can you call upon for support, whether practical or emotional? And how can you utilise the support network to ensure that you, you've got some backup yourself as well as those there to support your child? OK, so now we come on to the importance of creating a shared language with your child. So when we see a particular behaviour or scenario starting to feel a bit stuck, so you might feel you've tried everything, it's not working, everyone can start to feel a little bit helpless and sometimes a bit hopeless. And 
what we tend to see is that children start to feel as though the difficulties are their fault and they really lose confidence in themselves. And actually, this is often mirrored in parents and carers as well. So a technique that we use with people of all ages, adults as well, but particularly effective with children, is something we call externalisation. And this idea really enforces that it's not the person who is the problem. So it's not the child, it's not the parent or carer, it's not someone at the school, but the problem is the problem in and of itself. And what it does is it helps to create a bit of distance between the child and the problem and allows for a new way of talking about it. So we really encourage a playful approach to this because anxiety and school avoidance can quickly start to feel quite serious and that often tends to, to leave things feeling a bit more stuck. So one way to do this is we really encourage children to develop a character or a name for their anxiety or worry. And this could be a familiar character to them. It could be someone from a story that they love or a completely new character that they make up. And it's really important that it's the child who comes up with the name for the anxiety. And it can be absolutely any name. It really doesn't matter. Even if it's something, you know, totally bizarre, that's fine. The main thing is that they have a name that they've identified. And we also suggest that the child kind of creates some sort of representation. So it might be a drawing or a painting or something that they can create so that this thing becomes established as a separate entity to them. And then what we do is we encourage the child and their families and anyone else involved, including teachers or other people in their support network, to start referring to this character when talking about the anxiety. So on the next slide, we're going to say a bit more about how, how you do this and how you set this up. So this way of talking often really helps children to verbalise what they're experiencing. And it's particularly useful for those children who are struggling to articulate their thoughts and feelings. So firstly, here we have an example of how you might introduce the idea of giving their worry or stress or anxiety, whatever words that's been used, to give it a name. So we might say something like, you know, gosh, this worry about school is making things really difficult for us, isn't it? I think we should give it a name. What would you call this worry? It could be any name that you like. And if your child kind of really struggles to come up with a name, you might give them an example of what you call your own worry. So you might say something like, well, when I have worries, I know that a worry creature is telling me things that makes me feel scared. And when this happens to me, I call it Mr. Meanie. So here you're just really normalising that we all have these uh, thoughts and these experiences and that worry is a very normal thing. And sharing your own name might help your child to, to come up with something for them. And once they've established a name, you can then use this to try and find out a bit more about what's going on for your child, but in a way that's not sort of putting pressure on them. So if we take the example that your child has called their worry brain bully, we can then really start to get an understanding of the experience. So when is brain bully at its biggest or most powerful? And are there times where it shrinks away? And why might that be? So you could prompt your child, for example, if you know that on you know, Saturday when they're at dance or football or some sort of activity that they enjoy, that that's sort of a time where brain bully is not there at all. You know, you might prompt them to think and reflect on this. So you might say something like, oh, so what's brain bully telling you about going to school? What kind of things does brain bully say will happen? When is brain bully at its biggest or most powerful? And are there any times when brain bully shrinks right down to very, very small or even disappears altogether? And you might say something like, oh, when Mr. Meany shows up for me, he makes my tummy go all funny and I get hot. When brain bully appears, what do you notice happening in your body? So again, you're sort of removing that sense of it being the child that's responsible for what's going on and sort of creating this idea that this character is kind of leading the child to have these experiences, but it allows the child to talk about it much, much more easily. And finally, as we said, we want you to kind of really encourage that playfulness and creativity. So see if your child would be happy to draw or paint or create something. And you could also draw yours too. So you could say, oh, would you be able to draw brain bully for me to show me what they'd look like? What colour are they? What shape? Is it hard or soft, spiky or smooth? I'd love to see what it looks like. And I could draw my Mr. Meany for you, if you like. And by sharing this experience, you're really normalising that we are all experiencing this sort of thing at one time or another. And you might even give your child an example of when your worry creature shows up. So, you know, you might say something like, oh, Mr. Meany always shows up for me when I have to do a big presentation at work. 
And maybe a bit later, I can tell you some of the things that have helped me to shrink Mr. Meany down a little bit so he doesn't get in the way. OK, so we also want to help children to connect these thoughts and worries with their fight, flight, freeze response and to help them make sense of the sensations that they are experiencing with their, within their bodies. So we often tend to use body maps to do this. And you can continue to incorporate your child's worry character when helping them to identify these situations. So you might say something like, oh, these worry creatures like Brain Bully really like to make us feel scared and uncomfortable in our bodies. What do you notice happening when Brain Bully shows up in your body? And if they really struggle to identify the physical sensations, you might share some examples of what you feel or perhaps what you know other people might feel when their worry creature shows up. So for an older child, you might show them the example on the left, which sort of lists the various common signs and symptoms and they could sort of circle or mark which their brain bully kind of does to them. And for other children, maybe particularly younger children, you might want to draw a rough sort of body outline and think with the child about where they feel the worries in their body. And sitting with them side by side and doing your own body map, again, to normalise that these sensations happen to everyone, can be a really nice activity to do with them. OK, and throughout all of this, throughout these discussions about their brain bully or whatever character they've chosen, empathy and validation of the child's anxiety and their distress is absolutely key because without this, your child might not feel heard or understood and they'll be much less likely to engage in the difficult task of gradually getting back into school. So your child really needs to feel you are, you are on their team, you're in this together, you really understand what's going on for them. And it's possible to do this whilst incorporating the character they've created. So some examples of how you might do this are something like, you know, gosh, I'm so sorry Brain Bully is making you feel this way. I really don't like the way Mr. Meatly makes me feel either. Or you might say something like, you know, I can see just how nervous Brain Bully is making you feel about school. Perhaps it's making you think that school will be really difficult after spending so much time at home. Is that right? So here you're kind of starting to, to support the child to put words to their experience, to try and understand and help them to make sense of what's going on. But you're not making an assumption, you're checking out, is that right? And giving them the chance to kind of think about what it is that's going on for them. And also by naming their emotions. So it sounds as though Brain Bully is making you feel really scared and upset. And I can totally see why you'd want to miss school because then Brain Bully won't make you feel this way. I really want to help you with this brain bully so you can feel comfortable going back to school. So again here, you'll really let them know, I get this, I can see exactly why this is the sort of tactic that you're taking because no one would want to feel this way. But alongside that, you're letting them know, actually, you know, you do need to go back to school and we're going to work together to get you to do that. OK. So once your child has developed their character and you've started to understand the sorts of worries and physical experiences they're having, it's time to recruit your support team. And it's so important that the child feels that those around them really understand what's happening and that everybody's using that shared language that we've talked about. And it's also important for your child to know that when it comes to brain bullies, that we actually all need support to face up to them or stand up to them. So. A nice activity to do is to think with your child about who would be good to have on their support team. And actually particularly important here is that you will need someone from the school incorporated into this. But your child might also want other people as well. So they might want other family members, they might want their friends. It's even fine to have people that they don't know in real life. You know, fictional characters, sports persons, musicians, anyone that makes them feel that they can kind of tackle brain bully and, you know, help them to feel confident in doing that. The main thing is that you have a few key people on there who can be there to support your child and to praise their efforts throughout the process. And then you need to agree together about how you're going to inform these people, so those that you know, about Brain Bully and that you're going to need their help. So this might be about having a meeting with someone in person. So, for example, a meeting with a class teacher it might be a phone call. Your child might want to create a poster that they can share with people on their support team to explain what's going on for them. It really is whatever is going to work best for your child. And the more they're involved in this process, the better, because it really helps to empower them and to feel in charge of what's happening. 
if you are going to have a meeting with another adult, for example, someone at school, what might be helpful is for you to kind of have a phone call ahead of that, just to give them a heads up about this is the approach that you're taking. This is the work, you know, the name you've given, just so they can really quickly sort of get on board with that language and start to also follow up with that externalisation that we've set up with your child. And also your support team are going to need to know about the coping strategies that you've practised, which we're going to come on to in a moment. And also some of the support team might be able to help to devise that step by step plan. And probably it's going to be particularly helpful for someone within the school. So either the class teacher or another member of staff at the school, perhaps to be involved in that step by step plan as well. And again, we'll come on to thinking about that in a minute. OK, so we need to really equip your child with the skills to be able to manage that those horrible fight, flight, freeze responses in their body that they want to kind of escape and get rid of. Because if they feel a bit more confident in being able to sit with and tolerate and even sort of minimise those feelings a little bit, they're much more likely to want to engage in the step by step plan. And really, there's no point expecting your child to be able to you know, have a rational conversation or to be able to engage in a step by step plan if they're totally overwhelmed by these physical sensations. So supporting your child to firstly recognise those changes in the bodies using the body maps and then knowing how they can calm these sensations down is really going to be key in them facing their fear. And again, you really want to incorporate their character at every stage. So once you've identified how brain bully makes their bodies feel, you can expand on this. So you might say something like, Thank you so much for telling me how brain bullies making your body feel. Mr. Meany does similar things to me in my body. Shall I show you some clever tricks that I play on Mr. Meany, which shrink him right down so that these feelings aren't so uncomfortable and so you can feel a bit more in charge? I think they might work on, on brain bully too. And what's important here is that you and your child practice these exercises initially when they're in a kind of calm and relaxed state, because the more they get used to doing them when they feel OK, the easier it will be for them to then have a go when they start to feel anxious or distressed. And there are many, many, many different breathing exercises and relaxation strategies out there. You know, you and your child may already know some, you may already use them regularly. It might be that they just need some prompting or reminding to use them when their brain really shows up and to sort of know when might be the time to start giving them a go. Uh, YouTube has some really great visual tools which might help your child to learn how to slow down their breathing and to breathe using their diaphragm, so that lower part of the abdomen, in the way that really helps to simmer down that fight, flight, freeze response. But essentially what we're looking for is for your child to be able to breathe in slowly through their nose for about four seconds, to then hold that breath just for a couple of seconds and then slowly breathe out through their mouth for another four seconds or so and then holding again before repeating. And actually the counting of the breath can really help your child to sort of take their mind off those physiological sensations. And some children find it helpful to sort of imagine that when they're breathing in, they're smelling something like a flower or chocolate cake or something they really like. And when they breathe out, they're sort of gently blowing out a candle or even sort of gently blowing brain fully away. You don't want them to be doing a kind of huge dramatic blow, but you know, that visualization can be really helpful for some children. And also what's helpful to point out to your child is that these sorts of exercises, these breathing exercises, they can do them anywhere because their breath is always going to be with them. And also they can do it without other people even really knowing or noticing. So, you know, it's very easy to sort of engage in these exercises in a classroom or in the playground without other children or anyone else really knowing that that's what's going on. So do have a look on YouTube. You can kind of uh, just search for breathing exercises for children or relaxation exercises for children. Loads will come up. Um, you know, you obviously know your child best and what they might relate to. This one here is just an example. I'm just going to show you now um, of the sorts of things that are out there that you can kind of practice with your child. So I'll just show you a, a little bit of this one.
And it might also be helpful to teach your child some exercises that we call progressive muscle relaxation. So the idea behind these is that we force our body to create some tension and then purposefully release it so we can really experience that sensation of relaxation and that tension sort of dissipating. So we have two here that we're just going to talk through now. Again, the first one is something that they can do quite easily without anyone else clocking onto it. So the first one is about squeezing a lemon. So you're pretending that you have a whole lemon in each hand and you invite your child to squeeze hard, squeezing all that juice out, feeling the tightness, squeezing for about 10 seconds, holding for 10, again, using that counting to take their mind off the sensations. And then after 10 seconds, relaxing and letting the lemon drop from the hand. So you'd want them to do this with their arms by their side. And again, they can really see how much better that the hand and arm feel when they're relaxed. And the other one we can talk through, perhaps a bit less uh, subtle in the way that other people might sort of wonder what you're doing. But this is actually a particularly good one to do at bedtime if you notice that your children are particularly anxious, perhaps the night before going back to school. So this is about being a, a turtle or a tortoise hiding in their shell. So pulling their head up and shoulders up to ears, head down and shoulders, holding really, really tight for 10 seconds. And then saying to your child, right, you can come out now and feel your, your shoulders relaxed. So again, they have that sensation of things kind of loosening up and losing tension in, in the shoulders. And a similar one would be perhaps in the jaw. Again, that's a bit more subtle. So kind of holding the jaw tightly for 10 seconds and then releasing. That's also another place that we tend to hold a lot of tension in our bodies. So again, that's something you can kind of practice with them when they're feeling calmer. And then again, encouraging them to have a go when they're starting to feel a bit anxious and distressed. And once your child has begun to master these, you might be able to empower them even further by suggesting that they teach their preferred exercise or exercises to other people on their support team. So maybe a really good person for them to, to demonstrate it to will be to someone in the class, so a TA or the class teacher, because this will also help the support team to know what kind of things are likely to help your child when they're beginning to feel overwhelmed. OK, so the final part of our of our plan. So when you've created the character, you've got your support team in place and your child has really mastered at least one relaxation skill. That's when you want to sort of devise your step by step plan. So what you want to do is invite your child to think with you about how you're going to stand up to brain bully and face some of these fears. So continuing to use that language that externalises the problem. So you might say something like, right, I think it's time we started to stand up to brain bully a bit and we need to show them that they're not in charge when it comes to you in school. So we need to be a little bit sneaky about this because if we do too much too soon, brain bully is going to know exactly what we're up to. We're going to have to take it slowly. And that way we can trick brain bully into thinking that they're still in charge when actually you are. How does that sound? So it's important that your child is very much involved in this process. And actually, it's really helpful if someone at the school can be involved, too, because they're going to need to be able to say whether or not your step by step plan is is viable. So you're going to want to suggest that to your child, but also inviting anyone else along that you think might help your child to feel supported and empowered to give this a go. And also you want to think quite carefully about who's going to be best to suggest this part of the plan. So the step by step plan. So who can present themselves as the expert at standing up to brain bully? So that might be you as a parent carer. You know, you might absolutely be best placed to to make the suggestion. But sometimes people find it helpful for someone outside of the family to suggest this approach. So if you feel that that's the case, you might say something like, well, I remember that Miss Jones, your teacher, told me how she was able to help another boy with brain bully who was stopping them from being able to go to school. I think we should have a meeting with her because she'll be able to help us come up with a bit of a plan together. What do you think? And then it's about the, the teacher kind of joining and becoming you know, part of the support network and suggesting that this is the approach that you take. And what's really, really key with the step by step plan, it must involve small steps. So gradually allowing your child to face their fears and to stand up to their brain bully. So together with the support team, you want to sort of come up with a list of steps and then for your child to rate these in order from easiest to difficult. And you're going to obviously be starting off with those that are most easy for them. And it's important to start small. You know, if if we're thinking about school based anxiety, the first steps can actually involve things outside of school, because what we want to do 
is get them on board with this approach and to build up their confidence and to have that sense of actually, you know, I can do this. So this is an example of a step by step plan. Here we're very gradually increasing the child's contact with school. So this plan might be reflective of a child who at the moment is totally avoiding school. And you can see we're starting really small. So you, your child, some from the school and others on their support team can work together to identify these steps and to determine where is a good place to start. And it's important to remember that you might need to repeat one step a few times over before moving on to the next one, because sometimes the next step might feel a bit too overwhelming. So if they get really established and confident in that step before, they're more likely to be able to feel like, OK, I'm ready to, to take that next step up the ladder. And equally, you know, you're never going to get that perfect step by step plan at the beginning. So you might find that you've done steps one to four, no problem, but that step five just feels too overwhelming. So you might need to revisit the plan, maybe break step five down a little bit in smaller chunks and go from there. So it's absolutely fine to kind of keep reviewing the plan as you're going along. So here the example is uh, maybe trying on the school uniform at home. So you can see that's nothing to do with going into school at all, but something happening at home related to school. Then you've got driving past the school. Then maybe your next step would be to stand outside the gates. Then perhaps the next step, meeting the class teacher at the gate for a chat and working your way through the plan at a pace that feels suitable. So for, ch for some children, it might be that you're doing a different step each day. For others, it might be you need to take a little bit more of a, a kind of cautious approach. So being led by the child, but not being kind of pulled too strongly in either direction. So not kind of pushing them through too quickly, but equally, if your child's doing well, not sort of colluding with the avoidance and, and going at an absolute snail's pace. And obviously throughout this, praise and encouragement are going to be absolutely paramount for your child to face their fears. So, you know, lots of encouragement, lots of praise, any efforts that, you know, are being shown by your child, really commenting, specifically highlighting what you're seeing them doing, you know, lots and lots of that throughout. And sometimes we do also suggest using low or no cost rewards to further encourage your child to give things a go. And actually, you know, this is a very personal thing to you as a family. Some families love to use rewards, some really don't. So it's something you have to kind of decide together. Um, you could be quite creative in how you do this. It might be a sticker chart that you use. You might offer a low or no cost reward at every step. You might agree that you're going to do a reward every three steps. Uh, you might do a sticker chart throughout, but if they get to the last step, maybe they get a kind of bigger reward once they've completed that final step on the ladder. So it's really, you know, something you have to agree, you know, as a family together. And um, we tend to see that rewards might be particularly helpful where despite having set up everything really, really well, your child continues to be a little bit reluctant to have a go at the exposure. So if you feel it's going to be just enough to, to kind of tip them over to, to give things a little go, you know, that might be the time to, to start thinking about rewards. And if you do decide to use rewards, it's really important that you and your child are absolutely clear what it is they need to do in order to receive it. And rewards should be given as close as you can to the event as soon as it's taken place, um, ideally straight afterwards. And what's really important is that rewards are never removed or withdrawn. So if your child has earned the reward, even if later on, you know, something else goes wrong or their behaviour, you know, isn't great, that actually you don't then take away the reward. It's, it's really important that if they've earned it, they do receive it. OK, so just a couple of final points. So really important to remember to continue to externalise the anxiety throughout the step by step process. If you see your child struggling with the step, you know, continue to talk about the ways in which brain bully is making that step particularly difficult. So is it that they need a bit more help to manage the physical sensation? So is brain bully really making them feel horrible and uncomfortable in their body? Or maybe is it brain bully telling them unhelpful things about what's going to happen if they give it a go? And then thinking about, OK, what do we need to do then? What could we say back to brain bully to reduce some of its power? Could we ignore brain bully or could we lock, lock it away for a few hours while you give this step a go? So kind of, again, really thinking creatively with them. And most of the time, children will be able to come up with things that they, they can suggest if they're on board with this idea. Also really important not to be pulled into offering lots of reassurance. So that classic, we all do it as parents. It's so easy to do. It just rolls off the tongue. You know, it'll be fine. Nothing to worry about. Try to sort of limit that where you can, because 
what we tend to see is that reassurance is actually very similar to avoidance. You know, it's effective in the short term, but your child is very likely to start to need to rely on it. So we want to encourage them to empower them. So using the skills that we've talked through rather than kind of saying, you know, it's fine, you'll be fine. And again, be, being wary of colluding with the avoidance. So really projecting that air of confidence, you know, your child can do it, you believe in them, you know they can do it, you're there to support them and really recruiting in that support team to, to support you in that. If your child feels that they've got a whole team running around, you know, all these people here, they believe in me, they're going to support me, the better your outcomes will be. It really helps to give that child that sense of security and knowing, you know, I've got all these people here to help and they're on my side. OK, and if you do have any further concerns about your child, uh, we often recommend this book to parents and carers called Helping Your Child with Fears and Worries by Cathy Creswell and Lucy Willits. This is the book that we use alongside our parent led intervention for children experience anxiety. It's really accessible, loads of really helpful case studies in the book. We get lots of positive feedback from parents who have read it. So we really encourage this is a, another resource to to look to look at. Um, the NHS website obviously has some really good information, but we also really encourage you to speak to your mental health lead at your child's school if you continue to have concerns, because it might be something that we as a service can support you with. And of course, as always, if you're really concerned, you know, your child's GP is another point of contact to have a think and see what additional support might be available. OK, so thank you for joining today. We hope it's been a helpful resource for you. Thank you.